nice guy. What you might not know is that Stephen, uh, with his wife Donna, have been chasing volcanoes around the world for 30 years. And uh, he is one of the foremost experts on uh, volcanoes. He happens to live in this place called Volcano Hawaii. So that says a lot. And uh, with that, Steve, the floor is yours. Well, I know some of you went to Volcanoes National Park yesterday. Raise your hands. OK, good. So um, I'm going to try to give you, and those who went with us to Mauna Kea, and perhaps anyone else who was elsewhere on the island, Big Island of Hawaii, it is all volcanic. And I'm going to basically go through and show you in a, in a sort of visceral way um, how volcanoes are erupting, not only here, but along our voyage. And I'm sure there's going to be some things that you will not be aware of that I hope, if we have the opportunity, we can see. Now, all the photographs you'll see were taken by myself, my wife, and the, including, you know, this little person here. That, that person will go unnamed. But um, the, <coughs> the other thing that you may see, um, there, there are a few slides, and, you, and they may have a, a faint little thing like called photo researches on it. That's only because there are, they are my photos, but um, I didn't have them in digital format, and I wanted to show you that particular phenomenon or volcano. And so if you see that, it's not an advertisement. It's just that I had to go to one of our agents' websites to take it <laughs> in order to show you. Now, I want to start with something that uh, really what inspired me in volcanoes. I started very young, and I was reading the Golden Book on Dinosaurs. And of course, behind every T-Rex is an erupting volcano. You know, since I was growing up in Boston, all I wanted to do was see volcanoes. So I started to go on my own right out of college. I was ju jumping on airplanes and going. Now, my first volcanic eruption was in Hawaii. And it happened to be on Mauna Kea, 14,000 feet. You get a call inside one of the telescope domes, and it says, Kilauea volcano is erupting. So we run outside, dash down the hill a bit. Yeah, I know you're not supposed to run, but this is too exciting. So the first view we could see of the volcano was at 14,000 feet and a hole being burned through the clouds below. It was an awesome sight. So we drove down, we went back up to Kilauea. I went into what's known then as the Volcano House. It was open then. I had my first martini. And then I proceeded to climb down 500 feet into the caldera, hiked across under moonlight with no water, no flashlight, nothing except guided by the moonlight, and after being banged up a bit, I was also very young, <laughs> walked within 75 yards of a 200 foot high curtain of fire that was a kilometer long. And it was blinding, like being in front of the sun. It's just these things are pumping and pumping. And then I hear this crinkling, crunching noise, and I had to block the curtain of fire, and I looked down, there was an advancing lava flow. Ooh. just coming toward me, it's home saying, whoa. And I followed this, and I, I followed this eruption uh, just, you know, for hours, and until it, it broke out and it started, it crossed the road. Remember, there used to be a chain of craters road there, crossed the road, and then they went over to a hill, and it started to flow over a hill 15 feet down into the floor and pooled. And I thought this was beautiful, so I just took my seat, <clears throat> and I uh, sat down next to the flowing lava. It looked like a little lava waterfall, <laughs> which was really fun until I got up and I realized that another flow had come over and did the same thing. So here I was sitting here, lava's down below, okay, it's pooling. Right? Over here, lava's pooling. Behind me is a kilometer long fissure of uh, curtain of fire with lava flow advancing. So what do you do? Scream? No. You don't do that until afterwards. So, <laughs> I don't know. Some of you, this is really silly, and Madonna doesn't have a problem. Anyway, but I don't know how many of you know it, but I, I dance ballet, and so this so ballet actually saved my life. So we had to do two things in my life, ballet and also the fact that someone told me just 
recently that you can climb, or you can walk on lava when it's 10 minutes old. The air is so cool and the lava is so hot that it forms a crust, even though it's hot inside. But they said, if you have to save your life, you can walk on lava when it's 10 minutes old. So I had no other choice. <laughs> I had to walk over, I had a plan, and the little stream that I had formed, and I had to walk over, and then I had to test it, I had to jump on it. You know, remember uh, John, who, 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 Neil Armstrong, right? When he gets off and he's going to step on the moon, did you notice he didn't just jump off and say, hey, I'm on the moon? No, he was like going, it's one small step for man. <laughs> yep, that'll support me. <laughs> oh, yeah. So it's the same thing, you know? It's like, I didn't know if I was going to burn up like a torch. <laughs> touching this thing. Well, anyway, so I had to run up the side of a lava flow and then do a grand jeté over, over the river. And after being singed a bit, I decided that uh, I better uh, watch what I'm doing. So I decided to walk along the curtain of fire, and it just started to die out a bit. And it was forming into three vents that were pumping. And there was one vent over here that was up on a hill, and it was still kind of spitting. So I actually sat sat along the curtain of fire, right there. And it was shaking, it was like, I don't know, shaking bowl, right on the curtain of fire. And then the most amazing thing happened. The volcano started to die. And this is what, this is what got me. So here you have the earth being ripped open, and then this molten rock coming out cooling all around, and it comes up, it wells up, and it coughs. And you hear the cough echoing against the walls of the caldera. So. <coughs> Verberates, and the cough sends up all this molten phlegm that was flying everywhere. Oh my God, it's going now. And then it all comes rushing back into the drum of the volcano. <gasps> And it coughs again. This goes on for about 20 minutes. It's like, oh my God, it's incredible. And then the volcano takes a deep breath. And the sun started to rise. The birds came out. The lava started to cool. And it was over. <laughs> Eruption was over. And I was, I love this. <laughs> this is, <laughs> this is good. <laughs> I guess we're gonna have a little point. So let's go on, let's look, see some things about Hawaii that you might have thought. Okay. Well, first of all, here's the Earth. Isn't that pretty? A little blue planet, a little green in there. I know, but this is what it's really like. All right, entire, entire Earth is, <coughs> is riddled with fissures, and, every, and all along those fissures is molten rock. Even as we speak, there's molten rock oozing out somewhere on Earth. At any given time, there are 25 volcanoes erupting somewhere on Earth. The whole Earth is made up of uh, different kinds of plates. You can't see this very well. That's not very, uh, that's not very well focused. But anyway, these plates, sort of like a fractured eggshell, and there's, well, we've all boiled water before, so hot air rises, and then it, it I mean, the, uh, yeah, the hot air rises, and then it cools and it sinks. And so there's the convection that rips apart the crust into these plates. Let's see. And we know that happens. This is uh, a lava lake. Looking down into a lava lake, and we know that this is real, because you can sit there and watch this lava lake in real action rip apart, separate, and interact. All the plates interact with uh, each other based on convection within the molten lake. And we are, we are, we, we are now, <coughs> and where we're heading, it is called the Ring of Fire, and we're surrounded in this huge basin, and we have a process that's called seduction. So when two of these plates meet, what can happen is, and what does happen in many of the places, is that the uh, ocean plate slips underneath the, the continental plate, dragging down seawater. 
and then you end up with more explosive volcanoes. Like this. No. And so you have these large events, and that, you know, even Mount St. Helens, when it erupted, and you saw that huge ash eruption, that had nothing to do with lava. That was all pulverized ancient rock created by a gas, a gas blast. That pulverized <coughs> rock, and that's what we're seeing uh, here. It's just pulverized rock. And of course, all along the Ring of Fire, thank you. Oh, I have one. Thanks. Yeah, all along the Ring of Fire, uh, all along the Ring of Fire, you have uh, total destruction uh, in, in many of the greatest eruptions, like Mount Pinatubo in that 1991. This is a mud flow that was created. Uh, Mount Bunzen in Japan in 19. Also, 1991, uh, destroyed uh, Shimbunbara uh, district. And this is uh, Tunguragua in Ecuador that erupted recently, just a few years back, and destroyed some villages. So it's really, there, there's a very human-ass side to volcanoes that when you're, when you're a, a volcano hunter. And this is, does that look in focus to you? Yeah. No, it's, it's out of focus. Yeah. Anyone know how to focus these things? No? Well, so it's the Ring of Fire, and uh, the, these are different types of volcanoes. We've been to Antarctica, Mount Erebus, uh, uh, and so on. But is anyone working that here? It's good enough. Decker, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, well. Such is life. <laughs> anyway, what's interesting is here's, here's the Ring of Fire. This is the Ring of Fire. And here's Hawaii. It's not a long Ring of Fire, is it? So it's a different type of volcanism. It's the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, we're going to be focusing on the big island. Sorry, what happened? What? My parents. What we have in Hawaii is uh, a hot spot, which is really like a lava lamp. You see that little uh, plume that's coming out of the lava lamp? So what we have is a plate, a, the, the Pacific plate, that is moving over a stationary plume called a hot spot. And so what happens is along the island chain, as it moves off, each of the islands get smaller and older and erode. And we were here on the big island where all these uh, independent uh, vents are that are fed by this one stationary hotspot. And the difference uh, is that here is a typical uh, stratovolcano, which has 75% of all Earth's volcanoes of this type. And these are the ones you find along the Ring of Fire very beautiful conical forms. And here is Mauna Loa volcano, typical of a long Hawaiian shield, because the eruptions occur not only at the summit, but also along its flanks from, from various eruptions. So this is an example, just again, of the flanks of uh, the rift eruption. Most of the eruptions occur at the summit caldera. And the summit caldera is pretty interesting because this is Kilauea summit caldera with a miniature pit crater in between. And this is the crater of Olympus Mons on Mars, which has similar construction, as you can see. Olympus Mons is a basaltic volcano. It's also a shield volcano like Hawaii's Kilauea and Mauna Loa. But Olympus Mons is much larger than Kilauea or Mauna Loa. Here are all the Hawaiian Islands. This is Olympus Mons. And this is the caldera of Olympus Mons. So you can fit individual Hawaiian Islands inside the caldera of Olympus Mons. <coughs> now, the interesting thing, you saw that little pit crater, the small pits, how they form. This is uh, a lava lake off on the rift of Kilauea and in its various forms. And you see inside here, you have this uh, little elevated 
lava lake. And given times, this lava can suddenly drain, and when it does so, this is what happens. It collapses and it forms a pit crater. So this is a very sudden event. This thing happened within, um, within just minutes. It was there once and then wasn't there again. And we have a seamount about 35 miles southeast of, of Hawaii, of the Kilauea, and we have, it's called Luihi, but this is Luihi, and it also has a caldera. So calderas uh, seem to be common even when they're growing out of the sea. And this is a typical rift eruption. You can imagine, like what I told you about at the beginning. This is a uh, typical Hawaiian rift eruption that occurs along the coast, which sends out lava flows. This is a Pahoi Pahoi lava flow. You probably walked on some of this in a hardened state. This is an A'a flow, which is harder. I mean, it's, it's uh, higher. It's, it's less, has less gas, and it also moves around in inches long, and it's a very dramatic but uh, beautiful type of lava flow. Now, Hawaiians revere the, all lava flows are the embodiment of Pele, and in fact, when you see the lava flow, you know, if you would just, if they had grown up along the ring of fire, right, they would be going something like this. But they don't. They are in their hula, they're moving along, and it's very graceful, and it's always flowing down. Because that's what Pele does, is flows down to the sea. She, she's always moving, and she's moving gracefully toward the sea, where she ends up battling her sister. So as the lava flow heads toward the sea, it just uh, it makes its way in very dramatic forms. Now, there's actually an image of Pele in the end. I'm sorry if this thing is out of focus or the camera or whatever, but there is a, can you see her here? The two eyes, her nose, her mouth, and her, they call that the hokum lay, the lay around the head. And then ultimately it gets to the sea. The lava flows get to the sea. This is an aerial shot. This is a new black sand beach. Black sand beaches are not formed by waves crashing into the rocks and then pounding them over eons. It happens instantly. Lava's 1,500, 1,800 degrees action by the time it's coming out of the lava tube. It flashes into the ocean. Immediately doesn't have a chance to crystallize, pulverizes all the black uh, fragments of the, of the uh, cooled, quenched lava. It tosses into the air, back into the sea, and the ocean currents carry it away. You can see it here. That's all black, new black, basic volcanic debris, which then the ocean throws into these coves and creates new black sand beaches, which the ocean can ultimately take away once their, once their uh, eruption stops. Now, a lot of the times you look at eruptions meeting the sea and you think of something highly explosive, but it's really not, it's, it's quite gentle. Uh, most of the time, this is still dangerous. This is a bench, it's like an ice overhang and these things collapse into the sea. But it's, um, it's a very gentle phenomenon. The lava doesn't have, uh, it's, it's still o over the surface. Sometimes even small explosions, you know, they, but they're tiny. But if you have an instant, and these are rare, and they call them littoral cones, it's actually a submarine, eruption that occurs shortly right off the coast. Now take a look at this type of eruption versus this. Okay. That's big. Right? That, I can't tell you how many shards of lava, and this thing is continually exploding. It's just a, an amazing phenomenon, and it's so violent that you can end up having uh, water spouts forming and also lightning within the clouds. Now, first time since 1924 in 2008, Kilauea had its first ash eruption, right at the summit, right in the caldera, right out of one of those small pits. This is what I'm going to take you on a, a short trip. This is the glowing pit, shortly as you see it today. If you were to walk down the road, just imagine this, thing. this is how close it is to the chain of craters road. And then walk out to where they used to you used to be able to view into the pit. Visitors used to be able to walk up to here, right here. 
But you see, this is all broken now by these bombs that have been tossed out from the volcano. And look at Pele. Again, with her hook delay, watching the volcano. Now, if you go up to the edge, you need, you need a gas mask, you need a helmet, you need fire retardant suits, all the whole deal. You look in, and that's what you see. So if you were at Kilauea, if you took the trip to Kilauea, and you went out and you heard the booming and you were looking in, all the booming you heard were these uh, uh, small car-sized boulders falling back out of the wall into the lake. All right, so here's our little journey. We're going to sail from here down to uh, uh, American Samoa, over to Fiji, see the eclipse, and then cut through here. And it seems pretty innocuous after Hawaii, right? But it's really not. Okay. American Samoa is uh, basalt volcanic uh, formations. These are the islands. Um, and there's actually this little uh, region, oh, it's over here. This, and where there is what's called the uh, Tongan hotspot. So there's a plume, a molten plume, like a lava lake plume, under American Samoa. American Samoa last erupted in 1945. So it's not in, in, uh, impossible for something to happen there. This is what it looks like underwater. I didn't take this. But you can see these uh, basaltic pillow lavas right under American Samoa. More exciting, more exciting than that. And this is what I'm really interested in. This is where the excitement really begins on this trip beyond Hawaii. So here's American Samoa. We're going to sail over to Fiji, right? Look at this. This is the Tonga Trench. This is a subduction zone, mighty subduction zone. And you see that right there? West Mata Volcano. And I, I talked to Kelly and we're going to see if we can get uh, the ship to sail close by there. That's a close-up of it. And here's another sea view of it. What does that look like? Anyone? Mauna Loa? All right, you see the long rifts? OK, now watch this. This is a 2009 bang. First documented ever, ever, 2009. First ever documented submarine volcanic eruption showing lava and explosive. It was a highly explosive uh, event. Remember the one I told you, submarine uh, eruption off the coast of Hawaii with everything flying out? So this is, <clears throat> now watch, it's really beautiful, you know. You don't get the crispness of it, but you see there's actual lava coming out, lava toes forming, lava's oozing out under incredible pressure from deep below the sea. Just imagine, so this is sort of, uh, this volcano is like 3,500 feet below sea level. Imagine the pressure, yet it is still pushing out molten rock. And this is 2009. And it's little critters, shrimps living on it. And of course, if it does break free, uh, break free, you're going to have some beautiful eruptions of this nature. And once those eruptions do even break the surface, what, they're, they're, it's so explosive because once they reach the top of the surface, it, it's, it's so shallow. The magma tends to expand explosively because it doesn't have that really deep pressure. Less pressure, the lava is happy. And it's going, wow. So everything is coming out. And it's, of course, it's interacting with the seawater. And then once it rises, once the vent itself, once that vent rises above the surface of the ocean, the water is gone, and then you have lava. And so the lava starts to explode out. Now, here's the other thing. Submarine eruptions can cause, also anywhere along the Tongan Trench, and we're going to come to that very shortly, you have these pumice rafts. So whenever there's a submarine eruption, it creates sort of like a beer foam in the ocean. And then these pumice rafts, which are huge, this is uh, taken from a ship as far as the eye can see. And it's not uncommon to find these between American Samoa and Fiji. So it's something we should be on the lookout for <laughs> because these are a very rare phenomenon, but they are evidence of submarine eruptions, which, of course, geologists really don't know much about. They can happen. We're discovering new submarine volcanoes all the time. 
So we're going to go from uh, why I can read this. In Samoa, we're going to sail across over to uh, Fiji. Is that right? Over to Fiji. Over to Fiji. Fiji itself is tremendously interesting. It, it hasn't really erupted recently uh, in, in the past, uh, but there are, uh, this is a shield volcano and it has 150 cones on it, on Fiji. And there's other places uh, down, down here that are also of basalt nature. But the thing is, Fiji isn't on, it's not on a rift, and there are no hot spots there. So how can it have basaltic eruptions? The reason is, it kind of, it was, it's, it's at this confluence of two, the Tongan uh, Ridge and the Indo-Pacific Plate. And what's happened is it's right at this little confluence, and it's been doing a little do-si-do -si -do over, over, over time. And the whole plate has moved and twisted. Instead of just being subducted, it's actually done a do-si-do. -si -do. So even though it's not on the plate now, it used to be. So this, that's the fascinating thing about, about Fiji. And uh, you can see that. And it's, and it's connected to, like I said, the Indo-Pacific uh, plate, where we come up through, uh, uh, we have the New Hebrides Islands, which are uh, volcanic. And then Papua New Guinea, I'm gonna show you. It's uh, at the far end. Now, I'm gonna show you this too because a lot of what I've, I've shown you is, is shallow submarine eruptions, and you've seen it very beautiful. One of the theories that they work that they've uh, found is that the plate doesn't just subduct and it's equal all along the plate. It actually it's, can be tilted at places, so it's shallow on one end and deeper on the other. So. On the Fiji end, it's going to be more shallow. Up toward Papua New Guinea, it's going to be more explosive because it's deeper. You're getting more seawater, more gas, and it's going to be more explosive. I just wanted to show you. So the Raval uh, volcano is right here on the island of New Britain, right off the coast of Papua New Guinea. And so, how explosive? Take a look at this. This is uh, Raval Tarabur volcano, right here. You can see it smoking. But look at this. This is Revolve itself. It's a caldera. It's just this tiny fraction that you're seeing. This is Revolve. This is Tau River. This is Revolve. That whole thing is a volcano. It's still erupting today. And this was what was shortly before. This is a 1994 eruption from space. to show you how explosive these things can be. And of course, totally devastating uh, in its effects. So finally, we're going to come down toward the, uh, we're going to go right along, see the eclipse, and then we're going to cut right across here, right across here in, in the Tongan French. Right along what's called the chromatic uh, sea mount arc. And this sort of shows you the subduction zone that's happening. And it's a highly explosive volcanic arc system. That entire arc system, it, it covers about a thousand kilometers, takes up a thousand kilometers of the Pacific Ring of Fire. And this, it only is visible in three places. Look at this. This is um, Macaulay Island that we can see. That's one of three islands that we can see. But look at beneath it. It's a caldera. And these things are enormous. They have, they have sent out lava flows, pyroclastic flows under the sea uh, 50 kilometers away and 50 kilometers deep. They're, they're amazing arcs. We're going to be passing over them. But not only that, but one just recently erupted in um, July of 2012. August 2012, sorry. In August 2012, right where we're going, right across that little section, one of those submarine volcanoes erupted. And then right off of uh, uh, where we're going into the Bay of Plenty in New Zealand is White Island. And White Island is a stratovolcano, part of the, uh, it's slightly off the chromatic arc system, but it's a beautiful, beautiful volcano, which 
uh, over over the years is constantly changing. You've been there several times, and this is the way it was in 1986, and then it had a beautiful lake in 2004. Uh, it's it's constantly changing, and in fact, this is it. In August of 2012, taken from their webcam, it exploded in August of 2012. So there's two volcanoes in New Zealand in August of 2012 that erupted. Okay, this is their uh, New Zealand uh, geological survey <coughs> images of White Island. It's very beautiful with the, with the sulfur lake. And uh, so taking this, well, these are different. Uh, oh, this is Iceland, which, which hadn't erupted. Okay, get this. I've always wanted to go to Iceland and see a volcano erupt. You know, remember Surtsey and Petla? Yeah. Okay, I get there. And look at the name of this thing. <laughs> Anyone know how to say it? No. Yeah. 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 I have created a book. It took me, how long now? <laughs> Three years. <laughs> I have created a book. But it awakened after 100 years. All right? Then we had Ruapehu in New Zealand, which recently uh, erupted on the top. Then we had Tonga Rira. That was not my photos. This is the Tonga Rira, which is in, next to Ruapehu in Arahoe in New Zealand. Guess what? This volcano had been asleep for over 100 years. It erupted in August of 2012. Three volcanoes in New Zealand erupting in August of 2012. But that's not it. All right. Remember I told you? Oh, I'm sorry. Some of you were on the, on the lecture. <laughs> so some volcanoes. So what? What constitutes? What constitutes? What constitutes a a um, an active volcano? Like Mauna Kea, right? We, we talked. Those of you who weren't at Mauna Kea, remember Mauna Kea last erupted 4,500 years ago. So we don't have to worry about that, do we now? Yeah. Not wrong. <laughs> a volcano is still active as long as it's erupted within the last 9,000 years. Okay? So that's how we know. And this is uh, Uyehe. Who? Oh, wait, help me. <laughs> Whatever. Who? Well, you can figure that one out. But that, erupt that last erupted 9,000 years ago. And it just erupted uh, a few a few years ago, just within the last uh, two years. Which brings up another point: Lake Taupo. We're nearing the end. We're really nearing the end. Anyways, all right. Good. I wrote it down. <laughs> it's a super volcano. Super volcano is a different, right? Forget nine thousand years. You could be asleep for six thousand years. What makes a super volcano? It just doesn't erupt. It's, it's like something beneath is so too much capping it. So you have all this pent up energy, and it's just like, let me out of here. It won't come out. Okay, so Lake Taupo is actually in New Zealand. If you have the, the Rotorua area, okay, Lake uh, in Lake Taupo. So that was a super volcano. 26,500 years ago, it wiped out 60% of all life on Earth. Okay, 9,000 years ago, uh, no, wait, no, I'm sorry, I'm gonna give, let me give you the right number. Let me give you the right number on this one. It was uh, 18, I remember, 1,800 years ago, it last year. And it, it blew 30 cubic kilometers. So, and it sent out pyroclastic flows, something in the order of 100 kilometers. And the material went up the sides of mountains 4,500 feet high. Enormous eruption. Enormous eruption. And guess what? Right now, it's shaking. This tectonic activity is on the rise there. It's increasing. This is Taupo, the last, the greatest eruption, so 1,800 years ago, the greatest eruption in 5,000 years. 
Can you check? This is sort of what they're predicting it would look like. You know, the, the super volcanoes are just going to collapse and it's going to happen in the period episodes. It's going to happen in the period episodes where it's going to start boiling. And it's going to have little vents all along the side of the big rim of the caldera. And they're going to pick and it's going to pick up and it's going to pick up and it's going to pick up. Then it's going to, shut, then it's going to slow down. And everyone's going to be complacent. And then, <laughs> so the question is, is this the end? I mean, where the mind is correct, is this the end? <laughs> well, I knew, I, you know, I can't, I, I, I just had to consult someone to find out, to see if, you know, we're okay. And, and I just found out, you know, we're okay. <laughs> we're okay. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. What's 
time scale to the hotspot. I don't know about the hotspot itself, but of course, like Hawaii itself is moving about uh, the length of your your thumbnail every year over the spot. So and so it's it stayed there throughout the life of the entire Hawaiian chain. It's been there. And so and I also think because this gentleman uh, question, it's it, I would think it's going to be continually fed. Refed. In fact, oh sorry, you know that's that's an interesting point too. I think it's a continuous phenomenon. So rising plumes are gonna melt meld into one another, right? But one's gonna come up and it's gonna hit. The other reason that they believe in this theory as well is coming up in the center is because they found reprocessed, oh well, hi, good let's see. Reprocessed material from the plate, some ducking in Hawaiian lava that, that had been coming up. So they know from the from the, uh, from the analysis, mineral analysis, that in one of the eruptions that occurred, they found minerals that would only indicate that it, it had come from its abduction some time ago and then was re put up. Does that answer your question? Sort of. Sort of. Well, no, no, the hotspot's not going to convect. See, this convection is like two loops going like this. And so just imagine right where these two loops meet, up comes molten rock, and instead of being convected, it continues on a straight up trajectory. Goes up, and it hits and starts burning its way. It's like this creates a little bubble of molten rock that, because of its buoyancy, rises and then burns through the crust. It has nothing to do with the, the convection itself. It's independent of the, of, of the convection. Does that make sense? Kelly? Yes? Uh, there's another type of event I wanted to know if you could uh, maybe offer a comparison between the Super Bowl game and the day contrast Oh, the super volcano, and then contrast it to the Siberian traps. The Siberian traps, to my understanding, was just a very massive basalt flow. It was like the same with the Colombian plateau. But supposedly, uh, it lasted for thousands of years. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm not expert on that, but I'm pretty sure. I know it was a very large basaltic flow that obviously, you know, why that particular event caused extinction, I'm not tremendously sure. And Kelly, do you have any talk? Yeah, I can't, I can't, but that's a good thing. I'll look it up, I'll, we'll talk about it, but I don't have any expertise in that. But I do know it was a basalt flow, I, but I, and it's the same type of event that happened. It's a massive basalt flow, like Kilauea, like one of those fissure flows. So it's a fissure flow, massive event, lots of lava, I don't know the length of time, but you said it was long, and you know, that would be incredible. But why it would cause a mass extinction, I don't know. I don't know. Anyone else? Oh, yeah, wait, do that. Um, do you see any connection between volcanic activity and tidal forces, like we see with Io and the Jupiter? Uh, oh, if I see. Similar activity yeah. that on Earth, similar to what we see on Io. Yeah. Um, Io is, is interesting in, in that it's uh, it's it's being gravitationally tugged, right, by Jupiter and, and the double moons, and constantly. It's sort of like the inside is constantly like you took a coat hanger wire and continually twisted it, and it would become hot on the inside, and that's kind of like what's happening with Io. And then there are guys. Are, it, it's not the same because the, the atmospheric pressure on Io is different, and so you have these large geyser-like eruptions. There are lava lakes, but they're more some. The lava lakes on Io are they more sulfur-rich? I mean, are they? The lava lakes on Io are actually uh, silicate. It's still silicate, just like uh, one. So that's that's close. Like the lava lake images I showed you, then that would be very similar to to Io. And but as far as the Eruptions themselves and the plumes, they, they, like, you can't compare them because of the uh, 
the, the state philosophies of, you know, of, of the two are different. But the silicate volcanism then is very similar to what we see in Hawaii. Steve, I'm um, More done. Yeah, I was going to suggest. Folks, Steve obviously will be here all week as will all of us on the entire tour. I want to give him uh, another round of applause. Thank you again. <laughs> and I want to remind you all to join us for our uh, cocktail party tonight, uh, 5 to 6 o'clock, forward on deck 12. And uh, that's also, you can start casing that.